Good morning. Welcome to Harvest. We had an amazing week. Um, hope everyone had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Got to see some family, maybe still visiting with some family, but it's great to always sit back and, and um, appreciate. Uh, we have a lot to be thankful for. We have an amazing God that um, loves us and puts effort and time into us and challenges us, um, so we need to be thankful for that. Um, but at this time, I'd like to open with our worship set, would you, so would you please stand, and we will begin.
Well, thank you, Harvest, for the welcome this morning. It's good to see you all here on this cold winter day. Whew. But I'm glad you're here. I'm going to give you some announcements here this morning. And we begin with this week. Uh, this week is a relatively light week. His primary ministry taking place this week is on Wednesday. That'll be his kids, kind of our regular uh, session of his kids. And then uh, next week is when we'll have family night, so just a little heads up. But this week, just kind of a normal week, his kids with our regular time there. Uh, so that's this week. We move now to the weekend. And so next Sunday, there's a few things taking place. And uh, first of all, next Sunday is the beginning of our Advent season. And so we'll be uh, kind of breaking away from our Matthew series here and focusing on Advent. So we'll let you know. So that's next Sunday. We begin Advent Sunday 1. Also, that's Communion Sunday. So just uh, kind of a heads up for your preparation for Communion next Sunday. Also, after the church service, there's going to be a uh, baby shower for Kelsey. And it's called Fill Their Freezer. So I'm a guy, so I don't know what that means. But I'm guessing, what, bring in some uh, meals, prepare some meals in advance? You want to make an addition to that, Elena? deal. So if you do have questions, just uh, seek out to Elena, and she will get you squared away on that. Good. All righty. Um, also, when we think about his kids, uh, they're next month, the month of kids are doing a project, and it's uh, called uh, His Kids Rice Service Project. And so we're going to be uh, accumulating funds to purchase rice for uh, the Village where Titus grew up. Is that correct, Titus? We're going to be focusing on your village, uh, bringing rice to that. But uh, what you want to add anything to that, Titus? Awesome. Thanks, Titus. Yeah. So uh, to help you, there is a little Christmas tree just in the foyer there. It's the uh, fiber optic uh, Christmas tree. And there are some uh, glass ornaments on that Christmas tree. If you look at them, there's a little tag that talks about the rice service project. But also you'll find within that uh, clear glass uh, ornament rice. So we're encouraging the church body to take an ornament and put that on your Christmas tree as a reminder for this month about the giving of a, of a gift of money for that rice project. And so if you uh, want to do that, if you have, you're going to give cash for this project, we just ask you to put some kind of a sticky note or something on there, uh, that that's what that's going to be used for. Or if you write a check for the rice project, just put it in the memo. This is for uh, his kids, the rice service project. So that's what's going on. Um, that's the beginning of next month next week. And uh, one final thing I want to share with you, we had an awesome, awesome uh, event, you know, with the Todd Becker event, so church, thank you. And we got a, a, Chris, or a thank you note here, and this is from the Todd Becker team, and it says, There's Dear Harvest, thank you for all you did to bring our ministry to Goodland. It was such a powerful night, and we wouldn't be able to do it without your help. We appreciate the meals your church generously provided. They were a huge blessing. We pray God would continue to bless your church and continue to use you to impact your community of Goodland. Thanks again, the Todd Becker Foundation team. All righty. Now let me just throw one more thing at you regarding the Todd Becker Foundation. We did get together 
on that day that they shipped out to head back to Minnesota. Uh, we had breakfast here. The men's group served the breakfast. And again, men, thank you for that. Uh, Keith Becker, the one that's kind of the, the in charge of that ministry, he had to make an announcement. And he says, you know, Harvest, and I'm adding a little bit to this, but this is what he said pretty much. Harvest, uh, you know, I would have to rate you probably in the top five of hospitality that we've enjoyed. So I just want you guys to have that and enjoy that. Okay? Is that what was going on? All righty. Let's uh, focus now on our worshiping together. And the scripture passage I'd like to share with you to prepare your heart comes from 2 Timothy chapter 2. I'm going to be looking at verses 11 through 13. And the reason I've chosen this particular passage is because it speaks of the faithfulness, and that'll come, become evident there at the last of the verse. So our theme this morning is faithfulness. That's what we're going to be talking about in the message, talking about faithfulness. And uh, so to prepare our hearts for that particular theme and that message this morning, here's what uh, Paul wrote to his uh, son Timothy. He says this, Here's a trustworthy saying. If we die with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we have gathered because of your faithfulness. Perhaps that particular word and those thoughts were not exactly on our heart when we walked in this morning. But as we hear your word, and as we pause and reflect, you are faithful. And I guess, Lord, what I find so much encouragement in is that when I am not faithful, you still remain faithful. Lord, thank you for loving us. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, I think it's amazing, uh, just Paul's writing and like Pastor Brian's um, prayer that um, his faithfulness that he has for us. Um, again, so much to be thankful for, and it's encouraging. You know, we can. it's easy to kind of put God on the back burner um, until something bad happens, and then, you know, then we want him, we seek him. But I would encourage you guys to just seek him daily, hourly, as much as you can, because um, God's amazing, just like what? Paul, and again, what Pastor Brian just prayed. So would you please stand, and we will begin our, the rest of our worship set. Standing on this mountaintop, looking just how far we've come, knowing that for every step, you were with us, kneeling on this battleground, seeing just how much you've done, knowing every victory was your power in us. Stars and struggles on the way, none with joy our hearts can say, as our hearts can say. Son of 
Let's uh, pray together and dedicate our giving 
to our Heavenly Father. Our Heavenly Father, we, we've given to you of our finances. And Lord, I, I know that you are pleased, but maybe, maybe we were a little bit resistant this morning, I'm not sure. And uh, if so, a lot of times it's because, Father, we lose sight of whose finances these really are. Lord, you've asked us to be stewards. And as stewards, you've entrusted into our care these finances. And so in light of that truth, Lord, we have released and we've given back to you. So, Father, take these tithes as well as these offerings. May you use them for your glory. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, young people, I'd like to invite you to come on up for the children's message. Would you come up here and join me? That would be great. Come on up, come on up. All right, I'm going to have you help me, Riley. Yeah, you can sit there, I guess. That wasn't the plan, but that, that'll work, that'll work. Okay. All righty. Um, we'll, we'll change gears here a little bit. <laughs> That's all right, this is going to work. Adam, come on up here, too. Uh, I got a question for you guys. Uh, who's who's probably the greatest in God's eyes up here? I mean, of these two right here, we got Adam. Adam's strong. Give him, give him, let him show you. Okay, he's fast, right? Uh, he, he's really good at dishes. Is that true? He really, no, he's really good. Okay, that 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 that's Adam. I'm thinking God's saying, yeah, this guy here. He's really good. Well, we have Elizabeth over here. Elizabeth is smaller and uh, probably not as fast as Adam, right? Probably not as strong as Adam, right? Um, Elizabeth, do you do dishes at home too? Mm hmm. I heard that. Mm -hmm. Did you hear that? Mm hmm. Okay, she does do dishes, but this guy here does them. Adam does them a lot better. So I'm thinking that probably in God's eyes, Adam is just the cat's meow. I mean, this is the greatest guy right here. No? You don't think so? <laughs> That's right. God loves us equally. He has no favorites. That's right. So you're trying to tell me that God loves Elizabeth. I mean... Just as much as he loves Adam. And, I mean, Adam can do a lot more. I mean, he's just a bigger guy. Didn't have to. You're right. You're absolutely right. Well, I think that's important. You guys are doing a great job of telling us again and reminding us that in God's family, there are no favorites. He loves us all the same. Even if you can run faster. He still loves us the same. Even, even if you can wash dishes better than Elizabeth, he still loves Elizabeth just as much as he loves you. Did you know that? No, yeah, you told me that, didn't you? Okay, good. All right, yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about how God just loves every one of us the same. And I'm going to talk to your mom and dads about that a little bit too. But thanks for being good sports. Elizabeth, thank you for coming up here and sitting in this chair for us. That was, you're a brave girl. You're a brave girl. Awesome. Well, guys, you're ready to go to Children's Church. Oh, you're not too sure he's fast, huh? Oh, looks like we got a little candy. You can grab some candy on the way. No? Oh, okay. Good, good. All righty. Grab something and stay in here. Stay in here. 
Yes, sorry, you did remind me, Amanda. Okay, moms and dads and grandpas and grandmas, I have a couple thoughts for you I want to share with you, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking for your... I want you to reflect on what I'm about to share with you, and I want you to share with me the thoughts that these these words, these phrases that I share with you, the thoughts that uh, come to your mind. Okay, are you ready for this? Here we go. The first uh, word or phrase I want to share with you is couch potato. Okay, what comes to your mind when you hear about couch potato? Or I'll throw the other one at you too. Uh, he lives in his mother's basement doing video games. Okay, what, 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 those two together, what, what would you say uh, they, those words or those phrases describe? Somebody what? Lazy, okay. No, no ambition, okay. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That's what I wanted you to say, yeah. Couch potato, remember those words, couch potato, and uh, you live in your, your mother's basement. That's not a good place to be, okay, all right? But remember those things because we'll come back to those at the end, all righty? So today we're in Matthew once again, and I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Matthew and uh, we're in chapter 25. And so instead of just reading the whole section of verses that we'll be looking at, we're going to just break it up into sections, and I'll read a section, I'll make some comments, and then we'll press on and go to the next section as well. And those of you who have an outline, I'll try and help you fill it in, give you those words, all right? But we begin, first of all, in chapter 25, verses uh, 14 through 18. That is our first section, and uh, if you have your outline with you, it's this, the master entrusted responsibility to his servants, okay? The master entrusted responsibility to his servants, and that's communicated here in verses 14 through 18. So let's look at those verses. I'll share a few comments, and then we'll press on. So it's the parable of the talents. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. Uh, to the one, he gave five talents of money. To another, two talents. And to another one, one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work, and he gained five more. So also the one with the two talents, gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. Well, as we begin here, I want to make a comment about talents, because that is a word that pops up here in this particular par parable, pops up numerous times. Uh, and typically, when we think of a talent, we envision certain abilities or, or talents or a giftedness that has been bestowed by the Creator. For example, someone who dem demonstrates exceptional basketball skills. Uh, we would describe that young man or that young lady as being very talented. Uh, or we might say, you know, someone who's able to sing and play the guitar. We may that person as being very talented, okay? He has great talent. Uh, there's, a, there's a video I want to show you at this time, and I enjoy watching this one. It's a video about a young musician who will go up to a young lady with his guitar in hand, and he'll invite this young lady to uh, name her favorite song. It can be country, pop, or whatever. Name your song, and then this young man will play this very song for this girl. This guy is talented. It's a clip from one of those videos. Um, our first dance. What song is playing? Uh, give me a Actually, do you like it? Do you like that one? That's a good one. I like it. Um.
Yeah, when is it? When's the wedding? Uh, I forgot. Let's go right now. All right. All right. <laughs> Perfect. Hey, sorry. You need something? All righty. Oh, he's got a number of videos, you know, that's not uh, prearranged by any means. He just, he's got a talent. He's got an ability that's just remarkable, and I enjoy watching that. Well, um, what I'm getting back to, you know, that's what we call talents. We call that a talent. If you have that ability, that giftedness or whatever, that's what we call a talent. Now, the reason I'm bringing this all up for you this morning is because when we come to this particular parable, speaking of the talents, uh, the word talent does not mean a certain ability or a giftedness, you know, uh, you know, a strength. It's not what it's talking about at all. The word talent in this parable is talking about a sum of money, okay? That's what it is, a talent. It's a sum of money. And so what we see in this parable is that this master who leaves, he entrusts his servants with money. And a talent is kind of a, a weight of money. So if you had gold, a gold talent would be heavier than a, a silver talent, and so it would be even more money involved in that exchange and so forth. But what I want you to understand is it's, it's, it's money in this parable. And because oftentimes when we hear about the parable of the talents, immediately our mind goes to this idea, okay, this talent is some kind of ability, some kind of a skill, and uh, we're supposed to use that for God. And... Uh, that would be an acceptable application, all right, are you with me? It's an application, but when we come to the interpretation, what we have taken place is that this particular master has given his servants some money, all righty, some money. Well, in this section of verses, we found out and we discovered that one received five talents, uh, five talents of money, and he invested it, and he gained five more. And then also we are told that uh, there was one who received two talents, and that individual, he invested his two talents and gained two more. And then there was one who received one talent, and he dug a hole and he buried it. Now, we're not too surprised about the response of the first two servants, how they were faithful and they took and they invested. However, that third servant... His behavior uh, about, you know, he went and buried his talent. That behavior is kind of puzzling to us. It grabs our attention, and we're wondering, okay, why is he doing that? And we're wondering, how will the master respond when he finds out that this particular servant just buried in the dirt this talent? Well, we're going to find out what God, or excuse me, what the master thinks about the first two, and then a little bit later, we'll find out about that third one. So we're pressing on with our outline here, if you have it. We're on point number two, the master increased responsibility for faithfulness. And that is in verses 19 through 23. And so we're going to read that section at this time. Again, number two is the master increased responsibility for faithfulness. Verse 19. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Well, we see in this particular section of verses that the master is very pleased with the first two servants. But not so much with the third servant. We're going to read about that. Uh, but let's talk about the first two. Uh, the master's response to the first two servants uh, for the five talents, he said this. That remember, one received five, and he uh, doubled it, so he ended up with ten. And this is what the master said to him. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. 
So that was the gentleman with the five talents or the lady with the five talents. Now we go to the second one. He had just two talents, but he was able to double it, and he has four. And notice what the master this particular servant has. The master replied, faithful servant, you've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Now, I want to give you an assignment. And here's your assignment. Look once again at the master's response to the first servant. You see that in verse 21. So I think we have her up there. We have verse 21. All right, here's okay, the guy with five. He doubled it. And this is what the master said to him. Go ahead and just read it. That's your assignment. Read it. All right. Now, there is also a servant who just received two talents, and he doubled his two talents. And notice what the master says to him in verse 23. Go ahead and read it. Now, as you compared those two responses, what did you notice? They're the same, aren't they? Exactly the same. The guy who had five, he was our Adam. He was fast, he was strong, and he could do the dishes, okay? Then we had the two talents. That was Elizabeth. She was small, she was not as fast, and probably... Though tried very hard to wash dishes, probably just wasn't quite up quite up to snuff, right? Okay, all right. So they have the same response. So here's the spiritual lesson that comes from this: the reward for faithfulness is the same regardless of responsibility. The servant who received two talents received the same honor, recognition, promotion, reward, whatever you want to call it. The one with the two received the exact same amount as the one who had five talents. And so that lesson is this, once again, the reward for faithfulness. Just be, it's faithfulness that God or the master is looking at here. And of course, this is God too. He's looking at faithfulness, uh, not what you have on your plate, the responsibility. He just wants to know, are you faithful? Now, in the world's economy, okay, the world's economy is a brutal master. Because value and worth is measured by the return on your investment. In other words, if you do not perform, you are not important. Okay? If your output does not increase, you are demoted to the office cubicle in the basement. That's what happens. That is the world's economy. But we see here that God's economy is totally different. The two-talent person is as valuable as the five-person talent, okay? In fact, I'm going to propose to you that the person with the one talent was just as valuable as the person with the two talents or the person with the five talents. So we're going to read about him, the one guy with the one talent, but I, promote, I propose to you that even with the one talent, he was just as valuable. However, that servant with the one talent made some bad decisions. So let's read about it at this time. But before I do, once again, that spiritual lesson, the reward for faithfulness, that's what God is looking at, your faithfulness. It doesn't matter how gifted, how talented, how much money you have, or what. that's not what he's looking at. He's just looking at your faithfulness. And 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 the reward is just the same as if you had five, 10, 15, 20, 100 talents. The one with the two, and I propose either, you know, even with one, would receive the same reward. That's, that's our God. Okay, that's our God. Now, pressing on here, let's read about the guy with the one. And that's uh, point number three. We're looking at verses 24 through 30. And it's in this point is, or the, in your outline, it's this the master judged inexcusable irresponsibility. The master basically brought judgment for this inexcusable irresponsibility. And we see that in 24 through 30. So follow along, and I'll read it. Then the man who had received the one talent came, and he said, Master, I knew that you are a hard man, 
harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. You knew that? Well then, You should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For for every one who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, it's obvious that the master is not pleased with this servant's behavior. And and there's a tendency, and I'm I'm guessing this, but I think there's a tendency with all of us uh, on our part as we read this, uh, there's a tendency for us to demonstrate or have sympathy for this gentleman that had the one talent. Um. We, we, we understand his behavior. We get it, you know. The servant, he was fearful. Uh, and he, he did want to make a mistake. And so uh, he didn't want to make a mistake and lose his talent. So he went ahead and he thought of a safe place. And, of course, that safe place involved digging a hole. And so he placed that talent in that hole because he didn't want to lose it. He was fearful and so forth. So uh, we kind of understand and we have sympathy for this man. But the master, he did not like it. And so we have to ask this question. Why is it that this behavior was so detested by the master? Why didn't the master like the fact that this guy buried his talent? Why? Well, let's return to the servant's response. I want you to look at verses 24 and 25. So here's what this servant said, and this is what we kind of somewhat identify with. We kind of get it, you know. The man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here it is. It belongs to you, so here it is. I'll give it back. Um, It sounds like this, this servant is kind of buttering up his master, so to speak. However, in reality... What's taking place here is that this particular servant is calling his master a crook. He's saying to the master, you are a dishonest businessman. See, again, look look at what it says, verse 24. The servant says, you harvest where you have not sown, and you gather where you have not scattered seed. In other words, this servant accuses his master of venturing, venturing onto the other farmer's property and harvesting some of his wheat. You've probably seen those fields out there. You know that there's two farmers farming that field. And sometimes you kind of see the boundary line that goes through there. Or maybe it's just the, the, the weeds. It's just That one has kind of a darker shade than this. I don't know. You, you know it. But imagining when the harvest came, that the owner kind of drifted over onto the other farmer's property and harvest numerous bushels of his wheat. You would say, well, that's that's dishonest. You're a crook, right? Well, that's what this this servant was, was saying about his master. So it's not a compliment. This guy did not have anything good to say about his master. Um, You're a crook. And he also asked and here, the master says, okay, so you think I'm a crook. So you you heard that I uh, take stuff where I haven't planted stuff and so forth. So you've heard that, huh? And and if you read between the lines, it's kind of like the master saying, where did you hear that stuff? Where'd you get that idea about me? Because the, what we know about the master already has been established. Those who were faithful, investing, man, he says, you are a 
well done. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Come on in, man, and enjoy my happiness. Let's, let's celebrate. That's the kind of man he is. But here we have this guy with the one talent. He has no good things to say about his master. And, uh, and so really, well, here, why, we ask this question. Why, why did this guy bury his talent? Well, he didn't want to lose it. Uh, I mean, if you really knew that your master was pretty, pretty tough, he didn't uh, slack, slack up on you. If you knew that, you would have tried to do something, at least put it in the bank, right? But he didn't. He buried it. So what's going on here? What is this? Well, here's what I discovered as I was reading. The author said that the servant buried this talent for himself. He was thinking, okay, the master has left. And in case this master does not come back, I want to know where this money's going to be. And so he went, kind of had his own treasure map, so to speak. He went and buried this stuff for himself. But he got caught. Master did return. He said, well, I guess I'm not going to be able to keep this money, so I better get it back to him or I'm going to face more severe consequences. So, so anyhow, he calls, what's his review? He calls his, his boss here, his master, uh, a crook. And then not, not only that, he thinks, well, just in case you never show up, I'm going to put this money where I can find it. And it's going to be mine. So we see here, in reality, the servant is a crook, and his motives are dishonest. And consequently, the servant experienced the wrath of his master. That's how it ends. Nothing good happens for him. He experiences the wrath of the master. Now, as we seek to apply, let's talk about applying this particular parable to our lives. When we seek to apply this, it's important for us to remind ourselves uh, about Matthew 24 and 25, and the, in the context here, what, what is Matthew 24 and 25 being written about? What was Jesus' intent in sharing these words? And what we've established is that this, it, these verses, these, these chapters, chapters 24 and 25, are prophetic in nature, okay? So Jesus is talking about the end times in these two chapters, 24 and 25. He's talking about the end times. He talks about signs. He says... First of all, we do. Kn the truth is, the matter is, based on Scripture, we don't know when Jesus Christ is going to return. That's again, we don't know. So if somebody's setting the date, well, then we know we have somebody that's a false prophet. So we don't know when Jesus is going to return. But Jesus does says there's going to be some signs, though. There's going to be things happening in this world that seem to indicate, hey, we're kind of getting towards the end, and I'm about ready to come. So there are some signs out there, and so we can be students of the signs. And since we, he's talking about the end times, he goes on to say, since you don't know when I'm going to come back, you better be ready. And that was not last week, but the week before where we talked about the, the ten bridesmaids. There was five of them that had oil, uh, had their stash of oil. So they were prepared just in case the uh, groom didn't show up on time. And so they didn't run out of oil. But the other five bridesmaids, they ran out of oil. They weren't prepared. So the whole point of that story was Jesus was saying, you, know, you don't know when I'm going to come back. Therefore, be ready. You don't know. Be ready. Yeah, the signs seem to indicate that, you know, my return may be pretty close, but you don't know exactly when, so be ready. And that was the whole point of the bridesmaids. Get ready. We don't know when he's coming back. Now, that brings us to today's story, the parable of the talents. So, okay, what is Jesus saying in the context of not only being ready, he's also saying here of the parable of the talents, I want you to be faithful. I want you to be faithful. Since we do not know when he's going to come, we need to be about the master's business. Okay, that's what he's saying. We need to be doing things. Uh, Jesus told the parable of the ten bridesmaids. We just talked about that. Be ready. Um, and now he's talking about the parable of the talents. He says, I want you to be engaged. I want you to be using what I have given you for my kingdom. So in other words, be about your father's business. That's what this particular parable is talking about. I want you, I want you to be busy. I want you to be doing. Uh, continue to make spiritual investments until I return. That's what Jesus is saying. That's what he's trying to tell us about you know, in, this, in this particular parable, the parable of the talents. I want you to be faithful. I've given you something. I want you to be putting it to work. 
And so what does that look like a little more practically? Well, he wants us to continue meeting as a church body. You know, remember we, we had our memory verse, do not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, and especially when you see the day approaching. Again, that's a verse about end times too. God's going to come back. But in the meantime, I want you to be getting together, having church. That's part of being about the Father's business. He says uh, also, practical, continue to grow and mature in your own spiritual faith as a follower of Jesus Christ. So make investments in your own spiritual life. That's part of uh, being faithful. Uh, it says encourage one another as you see the day approaching. God is coming back. We need to be encouraging people to, to you know, keep using your talents, your gifts. Uh, be bold and courageous and share the gospel with those who are lost. Um, that's part of the Father's business. And I've been so, I've still been kind of on a spiritual high since we've had the Todd Becker Foundation here. You know, Harvest, that was a good thing we did, you know. Uh, all the glory goes to God. God used it. He went beyond our imaginations, at least mine for sure. Nancy says, yeah, Brian, you kind of had, your cup was kind of half full, you know. And uh, I was a little pessimistic, but God showed up in a big way. But that's part of being faithful as a church body, investing in our community. And so lots of young people went forward. Um, super. That was great. So anyhow, be courageous and share the gospel. Uh, invest what God has given you. Remember, the talent is about money. Uh, the master gave his servants money, but an application, remember, there's one interpretation. So the interpretation, I believe, is that Jesus told this story to focus on faithfulness. I want you to be faithful with what you have. What Jesus is saying, what I gave you, I want you to be faithful and use that. Um, so it's the whole idea of faithfulness. And so we can apply that to our own giftedness. You know, if you have a gift with children and lo love teaching and then plugging in on, you know, like his kids on Wednesday nights, that's, that's being about the Father's business. That's being faithful. But it's also being generous, too. If you're a generous person and you like to give, I mean, give. That's part of being faithful as well. So invest what God has given you. So uh, when Jesus, well, before I do that, remember I, I said there's a couple things I want you to remember when we began the very beginning. I gave you a couple uh, descriptions, some phrases, and some people. And what were they? Couch potato. Don't be in your mom's basement when they put on their playing video games, okay? Don't be there, all right? When Jesus returns, here's how we're making full circle. When Jesus returns, don't be, ca don't be caught living as a couch potato or playing video games in your mom's basement, okay? That's the parable of the talents. Be faithful. God has entrusted you. He's coming back. You don't know when. Therefore, practice faithfulness. Use what he's given you for his glory. Don't be caught being a couch potato or playing video games in your mom's basement. Let's pray. Lord, again, thanks for your uh, words of instruction. Uh, Lord, thank you for this parable. Uh, we know that there's other applications. Thank you that you've given us the freedom to uh, apply your word um, in an applicable way. But uh, Lord, we understand that... Uh, in this context, you're saying, let be, be about the Father's business. Be doing. Don't be just sitting around, but be doing. And so, Lord, uh, remind us of that. May we, not only as individuals, using the talents and gifts that you've given us, yes, we need to be doing that, but too, Lord, as a church, may we corporately just uh, have that desire that we, we want to be doing something for your glory. Uh, may we be that way. Thank you, and we pray all this in Jesus' name.